some of the cosmological stuff is where he starts to get into trouble. So towards the end of the Morgoth's Ring volume, there's this, um, what's the title of the section? Uh, Myths Transformed? Myths Transformed, yeah. yeah. Uh, so Tolkien is hanging on to this idea that Middle Earth is our world, or it is it is in our planet. It is basically Eurasia or something like that. Mm-hmm. And uh, so that this is sort of a prehistory um, a mythological prehistory uh, of our world. And so, you know, the elves have contact with these demigod, these angelic beings, the, the Valar and the Maiar. They've dwelt with them. They've lived with them. They've learned things about the world and its creation from them. And yet they come up with these, uh, these stories about, uh, in, the, in the form of the Silmarillion that we see, that Christopher publishes, and in, in Tolkien's earlier drafts of the Silmarillion, uh, we, we see these things like explanations of the sun and the moon, uh, which are, have a very mythological character, t- that these are basically sort of angelic beings themselves, and uh, they're providing light and sort of flying around. And also the idea that uh, very fundamental, as you mentioned, to Tolkien's mythos, which is that the sun and the moon are lesser lights that came after, I think, two previous sorts of light. So I think that there's the pillars, right, first, yes. and then yeah. there's the two, two trees, which are extremely important, obviously, because the Silmaril- Silmarils contain light from the trees. Um and that's the whole core of the story, uh, the overarching story of the Silmarillion. Um, and Tolkien decides late in life, well, this is a problem because if I uh, have these elves who are enlightened giving these mythological explanations that are not compatible with what we know by modern science about the heavenly bodies – um, that's going to make them look kind of stupid. So what he decides is I'm going to try to revise this cosmology uh, in such a way that it is compatible with modern science, but still has a mythological flavor to it, a mythological way of saying this. And it's very interesting to see how he attempts to keep that mythological core to it while changing so many of the the fundamental uh, sort of scientific aspects of it. However, as you said, it sort of threatens to destroy much of what he's already written. So it's it's alarming, and you're sort of like, "What are you doing now?" Now, my my suggestion to him would have been just just let it be another world, you know, mm-hmm. let it be a, a fictional world. That's okay. the The idea that this is our world is is probably the least important aspect. Uh, and you now you had a different idea that you mentioned, which is I that, did. yeah. What, what yeah. was your what was your solution? Well, actually, I've been criticized for putting this in the book, but I've i just <laughs> I had this thought for so long. I just wanted to get it out there, so I took the opportunity. Um, it was actually influenced by uh, uh, a uh, an idea in the the series of books known as the Egypt series by um, John Crowley that I'm a big fan of, and the the idea in that in that series of books is that at one time magic actually worked, you know, in the Renaissance, during the Renaissance and before, uh, uh, hermetic magic, magic actually worked, but then there was a change. There was a change in the world. And from that point on, it not only did magic no longer work, but it all, it looked as though it had never worked. Hmm. History itself viewed from the other side of this divide appears to have always been the, you know, the, the mundane case that we're in now, but that it was in fact actually different at one time. Mm. So applying that to Tolkien's idea, I just thought, well, why don't you just, when, when Iluvatar makes the world round, why doesn't he all just make it look like the sun and the moon or, you know, these planetary bodies and uh, the world is, and makes it look like the world has always been round. Um, problem solved. Could save himself a lot of effort. Um, I don't know why he never hit upon that solution. Um, yeah, yeah, so. yeah. I think I'd, I think I'd rather he just dropped the <laughs> drop that whole <laughs> aspect of it if possible. Uh, you've probably heard of this this idea of uh, in in uh, Islamic art where they deliberately introduce imperfections because only God is perfect. Um, 
Now, in a way, that's sort of presumptuous as though like your work would be perfect unless you had to deliberately uh, introduce right. an imperfection. <laughs> but I, I just was thinking of that because, you know, Tolkien is, is praised for his uh, obsession with c- consistency. Um, but at a certain point, um, it starts to look as though when you get to these meta levels of consistency, it becomes a self-defeating project to pursue it to that degree as though it had to be real, you know, as though it had to be fully compatible with our world. And yet you're still trying to create a fantasy, you know, situation. Right. No, I, I agree. I mean, and um, it would have been disastrous had Tolkien carried it out uh, any further. And um, you're right. It's, it's almost taking the world too seriously. It's like, yeah. can it just be, can we just have this beautiful myth? Yeah, we know that it yeah. wasn't this way in an Earth's past history, or at least we think we know that. Um, it sure looks that way now. Um, but uh, but that that was just that was his trajectory yeah. as a writer and as a as a thinker. He, he, the earliest form of the mythology in the Book of Lost Tales is very very much different style and tone. Uh, it's much more classically influenced by classical mythology. Um, it's more playful. Uh, it's um, definitely more uh, William Morris esque, mm-hmm. um, and but all of that tone just fell away over time. I think um, after, particularly during the writing of uh, the Lord of the Rings, he he sort of left that playfulness behind and started to get more serious and uh, and more um, more concerned for. Uh, things looking real appearing to be realistic i think it's probably i mean i can't read I, I can't look inside his mind i don't i don't know for sure but um having spent my time looking so closely at w- what he wrote and when he wrote it i get the sense that it was um uh, th- there was a degree of obsession there uh, he had to work out the details correctly and make sure everything was realistic and made sense um so that is a bit obsessive, like where there's, I mentioned it in the book here, where there's a, a ratio that he calculates out to 360 decimal places, yeah. or, you know, digits after the decimal point. Right. And then notice when the, the number pattern started repeating. Um, so that's pretty obsessive, especially when you're in an age where there are no calculators. Mm-hmm. Um, that's clearly he was more interested in doing that than he was in you know, getting back to serious work on the Silmarillion at that point. Um, so I, I think it's really both. And, and and there might be other elements involved too, but I, I do see both of those at play. Yeah. Well, it's interesting to see, you know, of course he had feet of clay like all of us. And, and uh, it's interesting to read these books and, and not only learn about the the what went into his successes but perhaps some of his mistakes and and for artists to learn about what are the potential pitfalls of taking this approach to fictional creation so mm-hmm. um uh it's yeah it's it's very interesting that um yeah very very interesting to to get this deep into it and but of course he was such a genius that even some of these procrastinations if you want to call them are fascinating in themselves Absolutely, um, and he gets into these sort of uh, metaphysical um, dialogues and and things like that. 